All right, thank you very much. So um, this whole session, when we curated this, this track, tomorrow is going to be really exciting because uh, in, this, in this room we're going to have a whole thing on prairie economics, basically how we can fund conservation, not just prairie conservation, but conservation of nature in various ingenious ways that we need to to diversify our portfolio. This mini-track this afternoon was really about how do you talk to people about prairie. So you weren't in here for the first presentation. It was fabulous. It was an artist talking about how she connects with people through art. Fabulous. And if, and if you do go through Gallatin Field, uh, it's positioned in the, just to say that mural is positioned in the security checkout area. So if you're if you stop there, boy, what a beautiful place to stop. So John Hayes just talking about how do you talk to the private landowners. This is a di very different conversation that I'm going to talk about to finish up. And I, and I know I'm the only thing that's between you and the social hour with drinks. I'm <laughs> trying to be all right. Um, but this is a necessary conversation that we needed to have internally. This isn't for the general public. This isn't for <clears throat> reaching new people. This is really about us as the prairie community of the upper Texas coast. And what we're defining as the upper Texas coast is basically greater Houston. When you say the word Houston, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So, you know, if interloopers like me, snobby people like that, they're like, oh, Houston's in the interloop. But then, you know, people in Cyprus say, oh, I live in Houston. So it doesn't really matter. All the processes that we talk about in this, in this session really would affect an area that is um, at least the 13 county metro area and beyond um, that. And we needed to have this conversation because we all are sharing many of the same challenges. Uh, we're not uh, we're working within an ecosystem of groups that, is, that are sharing the same challenges and the same advantages, and we're all, like I said, on the same team. And really, this came about when, <laughs> Click. when this happened. So I'm just, I, I think some of you guys have heard this story, but it bears repeating. Coast Prairie Partnership was set up because of this prairie. This is the Somme Road Prairie. Um, it was a Class A, Platinum, whatever you want to say. It was brilliant. Um, and Flo Hanna tried desperately to kind of raise awareness of this. But by the time we all kind of got around to putting our heads around this like Flo had done, um, this is what happened to it after a rescue area. You could, that's what happened to it. 90 acres, they wanted $18 million, and they wanted it in one month. Nobody had that kind of pocket change. Now, when, when we saw what happened here, we were so distressed by the prospect of this happening over again with the last remaining platinum prairies for the area. And actually, leave the back lights on if you can, oh, okay. because the film won't, won't carry. All right. Uh, that's okay. It's there you go. Uh, and there's, there's not a lot of, of uh, photography in here. But basically, what we said was, look, we can continue to work in isolation. We can continue to not know each other. And we continue to go and mourn sites like this. So what we did is the first uh, thing that the Coast Prairie Partnership ever did in its existence was hold a conference. We didn't set up a website, come up with a catchy name, anything like that. We did a conference in Armand Bayou. We weren't even an organization. We were just a group of people that were so frankly angry at what had happened here that we needed to do something to change the dynamic going forward. So what we did is we did a big rescue here, and there were a lot of groups involved, including Flood Control and Katy Prairie Conservancy, and we all did what we could there. And we distributed this plant material, but we said, you know what, if we're going to avoid this in the future, several things need to happen. And one is that we need to work together and vision together. We all have to understand each other's goals, but we also need to have a big, audacious set of goals. And so what we did this year, like, i go back one, there you go is we did this. We came up with a, uh, a very uh, cheap way of talking to the, to the prairie community of, of Southeast Texas, Upper Texas Coast, and asking some questions about what is it that we all can work on together. So, you know, what I set up from the very beginning was with this prairie conservation assessment, if you, your group can do it by yourself, you don't need to be at the table. But if you want to talk about joint conservation action, joint education action, joint research action, then you need to join with us because we can do these things together and use funds to help us all move forward. So the rationale was is that we all are, are in desperate need of equipment, manpower, publicity, all those things, and it hurts all of us. So we need to be a team and work together. 
So we brought uh, over 30 different institutions together over the course of about six months. And we, heard, we held uh, small meetings like this one that was held in the Houston Arboretum. And we invited members of the Prairie community, the people, the practitioners uh, that are out there on the ground doing things. And the goal was to come up with not just collaborative goals, but fundable projects that we all needed to, to work on. And the timeline, like I said, was about six months. We are, we've been pushed back a little bit in terms of publicizing the, the final report. It'll be out in late December, just as a Christmas present. Um, but the idea is we didn't want to do, we didn't want to have a thick binder like this. These are all the things that we need to do together. Because those things go on a shelf, they collect dust, and they're not useful. What I said was, if we have a collaborative goal that is fundable as a project, then that's what we should talk about. So what we did is we looked at five areas. Um, we looked at urban prairies. We looked at large-scale prairie restoration. We looked at acquisition. We looked at raising public awareness, which is a very key goal for us. And we looked at um, prairie research. And we asked people, not just at these public meetings, but through private conversations, emails, and, and other things, what are the things that are getting in your way? What are the bottlenecks? that are bottling you up from blowing this thing up? And what is it about those bottlenecks that is slowing us all down? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some snapshots of what we found out talking to the inter-community, the inter-prairie community. Okay, first one. So in terms of the key findings um, uh, for urban prairies, and there were, there were things that came out of these discussions that were specific to those areas, and then there were things that came out of these that were supra themes. So one of the things that uh, point number two raises is produce a campaign for raising awareness of prairies. It did not matter which group we talked to about what topic, whether it was prairie research, whether it was large-scale restoration, small-scale restoration, urban prairies, whatever. One of the very top things that popped out of this is that people said people don't know about prairies and that is killing our ability to fundraise and to get the dollars that we need. So that was one of the super, super themes that came out of this. Um, another one was, in, in this case, was to conduct more prairie restoration workshops. And what people really wanted for the urban zone was they wanted, as John uh, Hayes was mentioning, less depends and more protocol. How do you put it in? So we're all struggling with that. Uh, and we'll talk about a project later on during prairie research. We're hoping to find some answers. Um, because if every, if we're artisans with every project, guess what? That, that just strips us of the ability to go large scale. We have to have some better protocols for restoration. Not going to work every single time, but we need to have something a little bit better than what we have right now. Another thing was better coordination of equipment and personnel for urban prairie establishment restoration. So one of the things is if we want to do restoration in the urban zone, this is kind of how this goes. Jim Willis, yes, you're in Cat Springs. Yes, you're 90 miles away from me. Yes, you have all the equipment. Can you drive through Houston traffic with all your equipment at 15 miles an hour to come and do a one-acre project in the Texas Medical Center? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, That's a huge cost, first of all. Jim Willis should stay out in Cat Spring, producing thousands of acres of quail habitat. So one of the things that we've talked about is can we bring together maybe some of the public entities like City of, Parks, City of Houston Parks Department, maybe uh, Harris County Flood Control in the back, um, <laughs> and some other people that have a common need for restoration equipment and make what is called a habitat action team. Have a, an equipment barn that people can either rent material or we can get it close. So we're not transporting all this stuff from so far away and in, in, increasing our costs. Plus, you don't need a tractor for all these projects. You need certain pieces of equipment that can be smaller. Produce a guidebook for establishment of new prairie gardens. Now, these prairie gardens serve a specific function. So they do provide biodiversity, but that's not why I put them in. I put them in specifically to have people deal with prairies in an upfront kind of manner and actually look at prairies and know that they exist. So for me, it's a public education function. For some other folks, it might be primarily biodiversity, but they do both, right? But we need a guidebook, like, here's how you do a prairie garden from scratch. There is no such document for Houston. Mm -hmm. 
So what happens is we bing bong around like a ping pong table and finally come up with a solution that's very time intensive and we're all kind of stressed out about it. And the last thing is establish a seed swap system. So there's a lot of species that we can share amongst each other that if we just know where they are and who has them. Um, so a conversation typically goes like this. I need some native milkweed. Where can I get it? And after about 15 emails, we kind of figure that out. <laughs> that should be a little bit more seamless. OK, next. And you can stop me at any time, because I, I, I will still be talking long after this conference is over. So <laughs> even I am. Um, so landscape level restoration. So some of the, the findings here were, one is that we needed more locally adapted seeds for our area. And one of the things that we're already doing in this area, fortunately, is that we are working with the Plant Material Center down in Kingsville um, on collecting seeds from the 24 county area here, setting them down there for assessment. Now, we can get into the, 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 the problems of genetic uh, limitation that way, but right now we don't have um, a very good set of early successional grasses. We are just, it's like a cluster of things that's just missing there. And so what it does is it makes um, prairie restoration on large scale a little voodoo-like. You may get it right, you may get it wrong. If you get it wrong, because you don't have early successional species to fill in the gaps, that's it sometimes. Not only is that it, the guy's gonna go down to the bar and he's gonna tell all his buddies, and guess what, you aren't gonna convince them either. And it just kind of poisons the well. So one thing that we're trying to do is really get seven or eight species of early successional grasses kind of in the mix so that we can be more successful. Things like brown seed pastalum, things like um, a purple love grass, um, a little barley, things like um, a certain, certain species of dicanthelin. We just need to up, up the ante there. Um, restoration equipment, and equipment um, is it's a huge thing. We just, there are just so few of us doing any sort of work. And when we say we, when I say we, I don't mean me. I don't have a tractor, I don't run a tractor. The real crafts people who do seeding are very few and far between. So one of the things that we talked about was, in, in effect, Jim Willis and his crew with Wildlife Habitat Federation is a habitat action team for the northwest part of Houston. But we need one in the southeast, kind of going between Houston and Galveston strategically positioned so that personnel and equipment can get to projects on the south side or on the east side and sometimes in town if necessary. And then the last part is better communication, not just intra-agency, but between all the practitioners. So we're kind of on the same, uh, on the same page. Right now, there are some agencies that have certain seeding guidelines that are not successful here. They're just, they, they want us to underseed and things are very aggressive here. So we all need to kind of get on the same page. All right. Okay, as far as prairie research, I was really surprised at how this went, but um, the, the upshot was that people really, really wanted uh, some research in basic prairie establishment. And in two particular cases, not just prairie establishment in general, they wanted two conditions. One was rice fields. There are thousands and thousands of acres that are coming out of rice production right now, and we're really afraid of what's going to be there. We know it's going to be called Chinese tallow and, and other nasty things. So those particular soils and those conditions have a specific set of things that need to be researched in terms of developing a good protocol for restoring that acreage. The other condition is that we need basic prairie restoration protocols for areas that are being established along pipelines, on slope, um, and on road sites. So those often carry a, and Carolyn can talk about this, a certain um, <coughs> legal requirement to have a certain amount of cover in a certain time window. Otherwise, you might be in violation of the Clean Water Act. And nobody wants to take the risk of losing funding so, you know, sometimes as a conservation community, we give text out a lot of problems. Why aren't you using native plants? Or Harris County Flux, why aren't you using native plants? They're the ones holding the bag, literally, if that project fails. It's not us, it's them. And they can't lose those millions of dollars. So we have to do the research in order to get them the materials that will perform for them as well as Bermuda grass. So it doesn't have to perform better than Bermuda grass, but it has to perform as well as Bermuda grass. And I, we think we can do that. So the action that we're taking, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, is we have already started a conversation with 
various conservation groups to put in two proposals for the Restore Act VP money proposals that are coming out in January. Mm -hmm. We want to get rolling on this even before the report is even out. We didn't want to wait till the report was out because those are two funding initiatives that people told us you need to get behind these two. Third is basic bio microbiological research on local prairies. We don't know enough about the microbiological uh, communities. So one thing that's real exciting is we have a former um, uh, University of St. Thomas student with us today. Go Eagles, so you go the Eagles, I don't know. Anyway, uh, you don't know what you're passionate about either. Okay. So, the deal is we have a professor who is a microbiologist by training, or geneticist by training, right? Um, and he's actually sending his students out to sample various sites throughout Houston. Restoration sites, remnant sites, reconstruction sites, and to look at their microbiological signature. And the idea is, can we predict, based on what we're seeing in the soil, the microbes, that plant community? And is there something we can add to plant communities to further their growth? So, Tomorrow we're going to have two microbiological presentations, one by Betsy Ross, who was fascinating on our tour this morning to the Texas Medical Center, can't wait for that talk, and then one by Kelly Shields, where a student is going to talk to you about the process of going out and sampling all these sites. And the last one was better communication uh, between all of these people. So one of the things that they told us in this meeting was, look, CPP has a great website, but it's too much. There's too much. It's just, it's like a circus in there. I can't find what I need. Dumb down your website and give us like four tabs. Research, education, restoration, and, uh, and connection or something like that. Just make it real simple. And put us in line for all the best current research. That's what we want you to do. Make it, make it more simple. And so that's something we can do. And actually, we're probably going to go ahead and blow up the website in January and make it both prettier and more useful at the same time. Okay. So acquisition, this is a very critical one. Um, as you guys know, uh, there is, you know, I, I tend to think of my boss who's going to be presenting tomorrow um, about diversified uh, conservation funding. I think her job is one of the most difficult jobs in Texas. Because what she's trying to do is she's trying to rally the forces to save the Katy Prairie, which is on that bleeding edge of development. We are the fastest growing city in the country. There is no faster growing city. When I go out there, it is incredible the pace of change. And so if my son Diego, who I showed up on the screen earlier today um, in, the, in, the, in the plenary session, is going to get a chance to see the Katy Prairie, um, we're going to have to work in a coordinated fashion. There's just no way of doing it. I actually had John Jacob run some numbers, but he, had, he didn't finalize them for Harris County in the last 20 years. And I said, John, give me a simple something I can talk about. And I want you to tell me how many acres were, went under concrete and how many acres we conserved in the last 20 years. And then I want you to make a projection out for 20 years. What we're doing is not working fast enough. Not even in the same ballpark. So now is the time to very seriously consider something that we have never done as a conservation community, and that is to work on a capital campaign for saving the last great places jointly. It's not going to happen otherwise. Just we're going too slow. Everybody's working is 150%. Not going fast enough. Texas A&M University, fine university, just announced a, a capital campaign for four billion dollars. Rice University just completed a campaign a year and a half ago for a billion dollars. So when we took this to the Regional Conservation Planning Group, which came out of uh, an earlier process, we said what we need is a billion or a billion and a half dollars for serious conservation in the greater Houston area. We're all used to th not thinking in those types of numbers and going, oh, well, that'll never happen. We need to think in those types of numbers. This is the time, because within 10 win years, this window will be shut. This will be gone. Um, and there's, there's things like the Columbia Bottomlands, Katy Prairie, um, and other parts that are under threat. Damon Prairie is another good one. So we said, OK, guys, um, Prairie community, um, you like the word depends. And we ask you, what do you want to save? What are the priority zones for prairie conservation in this area? At first, we got what we've given you getting for years. It depends. Well, you know, I really. We want to save everything. <laughs> that doesn't quite work. 
Well, let's just say this one piece. Well, we need to think bigger than that. But I was really excited. For the first time since we founded CPP, we actually got a map of what the Prairie community felt like we needed to have as priority action zones for acquisition, whether working um, jointly or working alone in some of these zones. And so these are the six zones that we delineated for the Greater Houston area. You can, you can flip to the next page, which is a map. So this reads a little bit faint, but this is the Katy Prairie, okay? This is the Damon Prairie, which I need to get John to maybe tighten that up just a little bit. Um, this is um, Atwater, Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. This is Matagorda, there's some good area in here. Um, this is um, West Bay and East Bay um, in Galveston. And so what you're starting to see is not a plan of action, but at least a delineation of the areas that we believe uh, action should take place. Fortunately, there are some champions in some of these areas. The Katy Prairie has the Katy Prairie Conservancy. We've just <coughs> conserved over 20,000 acres, trying to speed that up. Um, East Bay and West Bay are work, being worked on by Galveston Bay Foundation. They're doing a bang-up job, and there's also the Atwater, or the, the uh, Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge, which is bolstering that area over there. Um, the federal government at Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge, they're, they're still looking to find opportunities for expansion there, which is very good. So that really leaves a couple of places where some joint action would be very welcome and very timely. Matagorda and Damon Prairie. And what we've talked about is we need a poster child for this type of collaborative action, right? And so we think that what the poster child is going to be is the Damon Prairie. Damon Prairie is a very complicated landscape, still has a lot of potholes, still has a lot of uh, corridors, wooded corridors. Um, there's already a little foothold there with the Nash Prairie on the K&G Ranch. Um, we're talking about landscape level conservation, so there's a lot of land that could be saved there, um, but there is no champion. And so in the early 90s, a group of birders and hunters and open space advocates and whatnot came together and did the first Katy Prairie Conference. Out of that conference arose the Katy Prairie Conservancy. So I don't know what the mechanism here is for getting a champion stood up in the, in the Damon Prairie area. But it's a conversation now that we know that we need to have with the conservation groups to say that we have designated this as one of the most ecologically special and important areas in Greater Houston. It is going to be threatened by the Grand Parkway. The time to act is now. Let's start getting our ducks in a row and start talking to people. I'm getting serious about this. This is a legacy project. And the thing that gives us some courage and some um, excitement is the Powderhorn Ranch. Now, we know that that took decades, really, to materialize it had much less complicated ownership issues than the Damon Prairie. But, as a Houstonian, I've got to say that if we put our mind to it, we can, this is the city where we can do anything if we think we can do it. We can. Send people to the moon. We can do the first heart surgeries. Houston is a great town because we have the energy and the spirit and the can-do-ness that we can just put, our, put the metal, pedal to the metal and do it. So I think that we are going to start in early 2016 having a very serious conversation about how do we piece together a landscape level preserve on the Damon Prairie and contribute to other efforts that are being done in that, in that general area. Where's the Nash Prairie in relation to that? I'd have to pull up a map. It's right in the middle of the Damon Prairie. Yeah, it's right in the middle of the Damon yeah. Prairie. But I mean, okay. if you would, oh, the south end of it. Okay. I can send you a can of of these. Just I north of the Columbia. Just know if it was in that zone or... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah no, it's in that zone. That's part of what made it so palatable. It wasn't just all the other landscapes around it. Mm -hmm. It was that the TNC has already kind of uh, has a foothold there. Yes? Well, there's another very, very important reason that you, that, that one would be a good place, and that is because of the Columbia Bottomlands right. um, project, it already has... Um, it already has a, a, a backbone, of, a background. It, it's within the Columbia Bottomlands Project. Even mm -hmm. though that's Bottomlands Forest, Columbia Bottomlands Project also um, can focus on prairies, the wetland prairies. And especially if you look at <coughs> areas that have some bottomlands along the rivers plus prairies, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you could combine those and tap into migratory bird mining, which you can't do anywhere else in that whole area except for for the um, Chenier Plain. Right. 
Well, I mean, one thing that, uh, so for you guys who don't Mike, know Mike Lang, is now with the Trust for Public Land, but spent years with U.S. Fish and Wildlife piecing together parts of the Columbia bottomland, and we're all eternally grateful to Mike for that. And this, this actually came up multiple times, that what we wanted to do was find a project that built on what you had done and other people had done on Columbia bottomlands, because we want connectivity. That's what we want. So I think that that, that is going to be the poster child that we're going to have meetings about early next year. All right, next slide. So public awareness, raising public awareness in education. So this came up over and over and over again. And it's, and it's not surprising why. Nobody knows that Houston was a prairie, and if they don't know it was a prairie, then why would they help us save it? My goal, my personal goal, is to make sure that every school child knows that the prairie was actually Houston's signature landscape. Um, and to have our city embrace the prairie as its signature landscape because it played an incredibly important and yet lost story in the economic <clears throat> and social and cultural development of the town. We don't sell ourselves, we never sell ourselves as a cow town, as a prairie town, any of that stuff, but the prairie built Houston. That money from cotton and cattle built the infrastructure, the banking infrastructure, the railroads, the Port of Houston was built to move cotton. So what we need to do is we need to take this storyline, which is a very deep cultural storyline, an economic storyline, and daylight it, and make it understandable to people. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things that we wanted to do, and, and we talked about a lot about this, is that we don't have an idea of what the general public really knows about prairies, because nobody has ever done a survey in this area that's, that's in depth. It's, and, I, and I say, well, if Coca-Cola acted that way with their product, they would have been out of business decades ago. You know, I go out and I sell the Katy Prairie, but I don't know what people in front of me think about the prairie. I have no idea what the product knowledge is. So I'm guessing. I'm throwing stuff at a wall, and I'm, I'm guessing. And I'm one of the better people at prairie education. I'm guessing. So I don't like guessing. I like data. And so one of the things that we're going to likely do is work with a local university, Bauer College of Business at U of H, or the business college over at, over at Rice, and we're going we're gonna to conduct a survey, market survey, to find out if people know anything, and if they know anything, is it accurate? And if it's accurate, are there data points that we can use to, to more appropriately sell it? Yes? Have you thought of the Kinder Institute, just because Stephen has done so much work? You know, I asked him about that, and I'm, I'll talk to you about that later. Interesting conversation. Um, but there may be some prospects there. Uh, so the Kinder Institute is at Rice University is a really well-known sociologist and demographer over there named um, Dr. Stephen Kleinberg. So it's a possibility. Um, so that's one thing. And that can be done. That's a fundable thing. We get the money. We give it to the university. They do the work. Um, produce more printed materials, especially guides to local praise, and create common branding themes for praise. So one thing that we're doing this, this year we actually were more successful at it this year than we were last year, but we need to supersize that as have a prairie month kind of thing. And so we got into a lot of publications and even on the radio ones for that. Um, so we're all doing things in the fall. It's just about getting all those groups together and saying, hey, why don't we support each other? Why don't we advertise each other's stuff? Make it an event. Prairie Palooza. Uh, something, you know what I mean? Because we, we get in our, in our own institutions and we do our own thing and we're like, why didn't anybody show up? We need to use our friends to help us while we help them promote it and grow the pot together. This is not a competitive thing. The last the two things are produce more web-based materials, including video content. The lack of video content in the conservation community is appalling. We're trying to tell stories, and we have no video content. It's Video content for environmental stuff is golden. We have the landscapes. We have the animals. We have the charismatic conservation here. I mean, look at, I'm looking at conservation heroes left and right in this room. But if you don't have a video to make it real, you have a bad looking website with everybody looking like wooden Indians, <laughs> that doesn't sell today. We need to spend money and get out of this mindset of scarcity where we don't want to spend any money because we're keeping the bottom line down. Well, you don't get any money if you don't spend any money. So we need professionally produced, really crack first rate content. And the last one is train up an army of prairie guys. Now, this is easier said than done, because I've been trying to do this through a program we call Metalworks. 
we take people, we train them up, and we send them into city prairies and other prairies to interpret it for the general public. This is very, very difficult. And I am changing strategies in 2016. What I've been doing up to this point is I've been training old people like me, people 40 and up. And guess what? Once you turn 40 and up, you have been told you're wrong so many times, and you have gotten so scared, you will not do it. You will not do it because you're afraid you're going to misidentify a plant, or somebody's going to ask you about an animal, and you're not going to know about it, and you're going to look like an idiot in your mind. That's not really what happens in the general public's mind. You look like a nature genius because you can name five plants. But in, in a boomer's mind, or somebody above 40, they cannot make the leap. So last year, I trained about 125 guides and got one. I don't have that kind of time. So I'm switching strategies, and I'm going to solely focus on high school and college students. That is because of three things. One is we need to diversify our workforce. They're highly diverse simply because they live in Houston. So the population is highly diverse. Two, they're too young to be scared. They think they know it all anyway. That's right. So you work with their strength, right? And you give them guidelines. And three is they're oftentimes looking for service hours. So you put those three things together, and then what you do is you put the secret sauce in. The secret sauce is a lot of those guys that I trained up, they were Texas Master Naturalists and older people, said that they would go on the tour and help, but they wouldn't lead it themselves. So what this is, is this is mentoring. What you do is you pair an older conservation professional or volunteer up with a young person who is full of gusto, excitement, uh, has the new converts energy, and they're the backstop, the content person, all that stuff, and there's some cross-bridging that happens. So that kind of thing could be funded. That kind of training thing, and we're actually talking with the Student Conservation Association for doing just that project. It would, it would be called Diverse Faces, Diverse Places. Nature Guides to the 21st Century. That's what we're going to try to focus on next year. So where to next? Where to next is picking the first targets. You can't do everything at once. That's a lot of different things. But I think that we can start the conversation on Damon Prairie. We are going to put those two proposals in for prairie research and where that could lead, and training guides. Those are the three things that I'm thinking about. We'll, we'll talk to the prairie community and see where they want to start, but you got to start somewhere. And that's, I think, where we're going to start. And the whole goal is really not to do projects. The whole goal of this whole thing is to build a movement. And not even build a movement, to expand on a movement. We have a movement going here in Houston. And it's a kindling. It's a little precious fire. And now we need to make it a roaring prairie fire. And I think we are much closer than we were when that Psalms Road Prairie went down. And there are data points for that. We saved the Deer Park Prairie. Okay? That was the first test of whether we could work together at that speed, at that level. And we passed the test. In city parks, Buffalo Bayou Park, 11 acres of prairie. Memorial Park, when it's restored, about 200 acres of prairie. Um, Herman Water Park, Hall. restored it. Yes? Willow Water, Water Hole, mm -hmm. being taken care of. So the thing is, it's in the lexicon now. People are figuring out what it is. The mayor went to a prairie planting that we did. Things are making process. Now it's time to kick this into full gear and have this prairie, re the, the city really readopt its prairie heartland. 